My name is Juliana Nicolasian with the Oklahoma State University Library. Today is August 9th, 2014, and we're in Venita, Oklahoma, interviewing Reverend Ramsey. Thank you for joining us today. Today we'll be talking about Attic School alumni and also the city of Venita. So thank you for being with us. You're welcome. Um, Reverend Ramsey, can we learn a little bit more about you? Could you tell me the year you were born and where you were born? I was born in the year March 23rd, 1951. I was born at the Craig County Hospital in Venita, Oklahoma. Okay. And could you tell me a little bit about your parents? My parents, my father's name is Robert Ramsey Sr. My mother's name is Joe Francis Ramsey. They was both my dad his family moved here, and I don't know what year they moved to Bonita, but they moved from Texas, north, kind of northeast Texas, to Bonita, Oklahoma, and they did some farming while he was a young boy. And my mother, she grew up here in this vicinity. I think it was down around the, what they call the Grand River area before they came to Bonita. That's about what I know of my parents and their early life. And what did your parents do for a living? My dad, what I remember as a boy growing up, he grew, he was working at a, what they call the Eastern State Hospital here in Manita, and he was a baker. He baked for the Eastern State Hospital, and my mother was a stay-at-home mom for many years, and then she got employed at the Eastern State Hospital, and she worked in the custodian department up until her retirement days. And. How, do you have any brothers and sisters? Yes, I have about five brothers and four sisters. We all grew up, and then my, after we all grew up, my mother and them adopted about three other children, so we have a total of about 12 siblings, 11 siblings in the family besides me. Large family? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, can you describe where you lived as a child? Well, I just about in the same neighborhood that I grew up in. I live at 501 Attucks Avenue in Benito, Oklahoma. And the earliest that I remember as a child growing up in Benito, I lived in the about the 300 block of South 2nd Street up until I was about nine years old. And then we moved to the, my mother and father's present location at 437 South 1st Street in Benito. And they've been there all these years. Can you describe the house for me? How many rooms? Well, when we after we moved into that house, it's got it had three bedrooms, a bathroom, a kitchen, and a living room. And most of us, we it was four of us when we moved in there, and the other three or four children were born after we had moved there. That was our final move, and that's where we grew up at. Would you share a room? Yes, ma'am. The boys would share the rooms together and their sisters. We had I have two older sisters older than I am. I'm the third one out of the boy of the family. Two girls prior to me and then we have two uh, brothers after me, then a sister, then two more brothers and then they adopted a couple of boys and a girl. Your early days in that house, did it have electricity? Yes, ma'am. When I grew up, it did. Now, I remember as a boy, when we lived on a Second Street, we didn't have a television, so at certain nights, we would, uh, I know we would, one night out of the week, my dad, with my mother and my sisters, we might go to the theater and watch a movie, and then at home, we would listen to the radio until we get, and I don't remember the year that we got a television. It was black and white, and we would watch black and white TV together. In the first house, we didn't have no bathrooms. We'd have to heat water and take baths in front of the kitchen stove. That's what I remember, but it was a good life. Mm -hmm. Well, growing up, what activities did you do for fun? <laughs> Just run up and down the streets up until, you know, we would play probably baseball or basketball as a boy, but we didn't get to run too far, venture too far from the house up until we got in junior high, a little bit older, they kept a pretty close range on us. So we enjoyed just family time together, running and playing together, brothers and sisters. And the kid, children in the neighborhood, there was quite a few families 
in the neighborhood where we grew up as children. Well, so, when you were a, a young boy, did you have any idea of what you wanted to be when you got older? I didn't. All I thought about was running and playing at the time, <laughs> playing and having fun, you know, so I didn't have no thinking about what I wanted to be as I got old. I didn't start thinking about that until I got in high school and it was about time to get out of school and then I started thinking about what I was going to do, but really what I wanted to do was play sports, you know, and I played sports and enjoyed playing those. Mm -hmm. Other than that, you know, but I was blessed to get a hired on and had a job for 40 years that I worked on. Plus, I was a pastor. I've been a pastor for over 31 years in this community. I didn't have to leave the town in which I grew up to become a pastor or work. I've been here all my life, 63 years, and I've enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Well. Describe the town of Vanita for me when, when you were growing up. As I knew, we kind of was kind of off in a segregated area of town where the blacks most lived. That we had a few Caucasians that lived in the community that we would run and round and play with, but it was mostly segregated, you know. And we just went to certain places. I even remember as a little bitty boy, I don't know the time and date, that there was a few black. Uh, entrepreneurs here in Vanita, that one in particular was the Venice's uh, restaurant that we had on uh, East Illinois that we would go there and sometimes sit down and eat with my dad. I got to go a bunch of places with my dad as a boy, you know, so I enjoyed that, you know, and that's what I remember. That's some of the things that do, but most things that stick in me, like I said, was when we had family night and we'd go to the theater that we was allowed as a black folks to go to the center theater maybe once a week as a family, so I enjoyed that. Didn't do much swimming. We didn't go to the swimming pool much as children until, I, like I said, up until my later years, the junior high and stuff like that. So after that, we did get to go swimming and stuff, but I just enjoyed I just cherished my childhood days. You know, I didn't have no worries or anything that my parents provided for me and everything, so. Like I said, all I did was enjoy living when I was a child. You know, I enjoyed family and my father and mother and them and my sisters and stuff, but it was like any other family. We'd have our squabbles and stuff. But growing up in Benito, like I said, we was kind of in a segregated area and we just made the best out of life, growing gardens and, you know, that's how we got some of our food, you know, and stuff that we would raise our gardens during the summer and stuff, but my dad and them worked. Spent some time with my grandfather and my grandmother growing up and some of my aunties. So that's what we did, you know, spend time with our grandparents and parents growing up as children and stuff. But it was kind of, you know, we was all to ourselves, but it was still a good life. Mm -hmm. What What were your neighbors like? Well, most of them, like I said, was black and we was all, I think we was a close-knitted neighborhood, you know, you can go and borrow stuff when you need it and they would look at you and take care of you, you know. Did you attend church growing up? Yes, ma'am. I would go every Sunday. My mother went, but my dad didn't until late on in life. And and so we, she'd make sure we'd go to church, we'd go to Sunday school, and uh, they'd have vacation Bible school, and we'd go to church out and there's a church and stuff, you know, so yeah, we went to church quite often. <laughs> what was the uh, name of your early church? The early church was the First Baptist Church of Bonita. Okay. And we combined those two churches for probably about, uh, there was two Baptist churches here in Bonita, I remember. We had a few holiness churches. We had two Methodist churches. And of course, my mother went to the Baptist church and my grandparents on my father's side was went to what they call Bethel AME Church in Bonita. It's shut down now and we had to, we still have the two Baptist churches which was a sun, sunrise where I started out passing and we had First Baptist Church and I grew up as a child at uh, First Baptist. I got ordained as a deacon there and I, I answered my call there and uh, 
a pastor by the name of L. A. Brown, 30, 30 over thirty three years ago. So we grew up there at the Baptist Church, but like I said, because it was close knit at all, the two churches I lived and was raised up in the southeast section of Anita, and those two churches, the First Baptist and Bethel, will have vacation Bible school in the summertime together. So we celebrated that that way, you know, as churches. Mm -hmm. So that's my life as church. Well, let's talk about going to school. Where did you start out going to elementary school? I went to, I started out my, at Attucks, my first grade year in Attucks. And I remember playing and running and playing, you know. My teachers at that time, we, when I started the school, I, we had uh, Mrs. We called her Mrs. Bly, Mrs. Uh, Hardrick, and I remember, I, I think it was the superintendent, Mr. Bly, you know, and those are the teachers that I can rem remember because we didn't have much dealing with the other upper grades at school. They kept us kind of sheltered from the other school, you know, and I think they went up to the, when I went, I think they went up to the 12th grade, but I can just remember the times we had with our classes and stuff. And how would you get to school? I would have to walk. We walked. How far of a walk was that for you? About four or five blocks. Mm -hmm. but we walked. Rain and snow? and Rain and snow. That's what I tell my grandchildren now. Even after we integrated, my sister and I, we didn't have lunch at school. We'd have to run home and eat lunch and get back within 30 minutes or so. So we'd have to run home, fix lunch, because my parents was both working at the time that we was in junior high, but we'd run home and fix lunch. Or either, I remember most of the kids, even in the earlier school, would bring their lunches to school, you know, and stuff. So most of us would do that way, take our lunches to school. But we we didn't have no transportation to get back and forth to school. We would have to walk. So that's how we got back and forth to school was walk. Mm -hmm. Well, can you describe Attucks for me, what you remember from those early years? What I remember as Attucks is I remember the teachers and how they voted they was to the children, that they spent a bunch of time instructing and teaching the children on what they wanted them to learn. And like I said, I didn't get to spend much time. All I remember is the classes, a few of the children that was in my class with me, that we grew up together. Wasn't very many in our class. I can just remember about three boys and about three girls or four girls that I grew up with that we went to school, so my classes wasn't very big, you know, but it was all I can remember is the devotion that the teachers had towards their students as uh, teaching them and instructing them on mm -hmm. the subjects that we had to learn, you know, as a child. And like I said, so far back, you know, I just barely can remember going to school. But can you recall what your classroom looked like? A little small. It was probably a little smaller than this room that we're in. I remember the radiators that we used to have in the schools, that they try to heat the classrooms up in the winter. We had hardwood floors and it smelled like a school. You know, I remember <laughs> the wax and stuff that you used on the floors and the big windows. Remember the desk setting up where the teacher would sit behind in the chalkboards, you know. Mm -hmm. The bitty desk that we would sit in, that's what I, re that's what I recall. Mm -hmm. And I love the smell of the school, the cleanliness of it when you'd walk in in the mornings and stuff, I had smell. So that's what I remember about it as a child, little child growing up and going to school. Well, when you were you were going to school at Attucks, the process of integration started here in Venita. From what I could tell, it was a slow process. Um, do you remember, did you have any idea what was happening when Attucks was starting to wane and close down? Not really until the first day of school is what I remember that we, and see, they, like I said, we had to go from the, south end of town up to the north side of town and we'd had to like I said we'd had to walk to school and 
And I didn't really know what it was until we got up in and, and really that's when some of the troubles that we had with the children, uh, the Caucasians, and, and we had a little squabble, I think, the first or second day of school, the children did, and so they separated us and made the black children walk on one side of the street and the Caucasian children would have to walk on, and we was all from the same side of town. But we had a little squabbling. But it got better as the years grew, you know. We got to know each other and because of the sports and stuff, and even our classes. But I think sports is what brought us close together as people. Mm -hmm. that we met friends and stuff, and we became friends and stuff. And it got easier. Like you said, I was probably too young to really understand some of the prejudice that we have. But I still remember some of the things, like say we wasn't always privy to go to the restaurants and stuff. And I remember one of the restaurants in particular where you had to go to the window and buy your food and they'd put the food outside to you and stuff like that. Because I didn't go uptown much. <laughs> but I started recognizing that the older I got that I could recognize and see some of the things, you know. That things were different. Yeah, it was a whole lot different. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it gets better, mm -hmm. and it's better today, you know. Well, after Addicts, you went to Riverside? Yes, ma'am. And what was that like for you? It was a four-room classroom, <laughs> four teachers, wow. you know. And we was all integrated, but the classes wasn't real big, you know, so it was a four-room, I think it was the third fourth and fifth grade or sixth grade, you know, there that went there. And, and so we had four teachers. I remember two of them real well, Miss Wright and Miss Cotton. They, and I think they were sisters. One of them was the principal and the other one was the teachers. I can't remember the other two teachers. It, no, it may have been just the third and fourth grade or, the four, or fifth and sixth grade that we went up there because it was two teachers. But it was four classrooms, and they had us broke up, you know, split up the classes and stuff that way. So mm -hmm. it was good. Like I said, after we got settled in and things got settled down, you know, it wasn't bad going to school up there, you know, and meeting different people and stuff and the teachers. Mm -hmm. So that's what I remember about that. Was it a further walk to Riverside? Yes, ma'am. How far from your house? It was about eight or nine blocks. Mm -hmm. And we'd have to walk some in winter. And back then we didn't have air conditioners. <laughs> Summertime, and we'd always start in August, and it was hot from August to probably late September and early October. So I remember us raising our windows up to get cooled off a little bit. And would you bring your lunch at that point, or how, was there a cafeteria? It was caf. They provided the in the fourth grade, I don't think we had cafeteria, so we'd have to take our lunch. It didn't get better for us until we got to junior high, you know, and they had cafeterias and stuff, So we but we wasn't able to get meals, so we'd have to walk home. But the other private, the little elementary schools, I think you either brought your lunch. Okay. So that's what we did, if we had it to take. At times, you know, it may have been times that we didn't have nothing to take for lunch. Mm -hmm. So it was good. And I, like I said, I I could see the advancement of it each year, you know, that it would get better because people are afraid of the unknown. And when they get used to something, I think it gets better, but we didn't know. And sometimes you just had to fend for yourself because you may be ignorant to the facts, but other people, you know, so I think a bunch of it during my days of going to school is that you just had to defend yourself. But I've learned down through the years that I appreciate the struggle that people went through to get rights that we all have as people, and I appreciate those people. That I, I love history, and especially of, of the black people and how they struggle for rights and stuff. So I appreciate what people have done for us down through the years. Mm -hmm. Was there a big civil rights movement in Veneta? Not a whole lot. I think people was kind of complacent, you know, with the way things were. 
so they were just settled in for what they had and what they'd done, you know. So I didn't see a whole bunch of civil rights movements and stuff in Renita per se, you know. And then people, some of our people didn't like it. If somebody would stand up for their rights and stuff, they would call them troublemakers and stuff, you know. So, but I appreciate what we had and what people done for us, you know. Mm -hmm. One of the things I see, because I got my grandchildren, uh, in a, I have a bunch of interracial grandchildren and stuff. And I think the younger people is accepting society now more so than some of us older people, you know, around here, you know. So, but we got it. Because I kind of had a struggle with it at first because of how I was raised and stuff, but they don't seem to mind now my grandchildren and stuff, you know. So, I appreciate them, both of my sons. Well, one of my sons have uh, children uh, uh, that's uh, mixed children. You know, I got about four or five of them that's mixed. And so you learn how to live with it and deal with it, you know. So, mm -hmm. so that's what it is. That's what Benita's meant to me down through the years with the school and what I've been, where I've been and everything, you know. So. Even on my job in the later years, after I started working, I worked for PSO, Public Service, which is an electric company, for over 40 years, and I ran into some racial comments and stuff from some of the people that we worked for, customers, and even some of the employees, not say, yeah, in public service, and some when we go out on storm breaks that they would make racial remarks. So I had to deal with that too because I was a, probably the only black person around here that worked for a utility company. Mm -hmm. And we went up different places all over the United States and worked, so people wasn't ready for that, I don't guess. So you just have to learn how to deal with it. You can either make it good for yourself or make it bad for you. Mm -hmm. Well, after Riverside, you went to junior high. Where did you go to junior high? I went to uh, uh, junior high. We had the junior high, which was, uh, I don't remember the name of it. All I remember is junior high, which was on Canadian and Smith Street, on the corner of Canadian and Smith Street. And we didn't use, it was a three-story building, but we didn't use all the rooms in it. I think we used the first two floors in the basement of it when we went to school there, you know. Did you play sports in junior high? Yes, ma'am. What sports did you play? I played football, basketball, and ran track, and played a little baseball in the summertime, so that's all we did. You know, that's the kind of entertainment we had as children growing up, was baseball in the spring, and football and basketball. We just played over in the park. And when we went to school, we got to start playing sports and stuff. So. Well, when you transitioned over to the high school, did you continue playing sports? Yes. Uh, baseball, basketball, uh, not baseball, football, basketball, track. I didn't play baseball in school. Those were the only three that I played. And uh, tell me the name of your high school. Uh, Ewan Hustle High School. Okay. That's where we graduated from. So. Uh, in high school, you were playing sports. Who were some of your bigger, bigger rivals? What cities were your bigger rivals? Claremore, Claremore, and uh, Miami, and No Water. No Water was probably the, the biggest rival that we have and still is today. But Claremore was, I was telling my children on yesterday as we came through, that was probably our biggest rival when we came, when we was in high school, was Claremore until it outgrew Benita. And, we no longer play them, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in high school, did you have uh, any favorite subjects you liked? My favorite, well, to be honest with you, <laughs> in high school, I just went to school because I had to go, you know. My, but the older I got and realized that it was about time to get out of school, I really buckled down and took care. I loved, uh, like I said, I loved history. 
appreciated it. English was one of my favorite favorite sports, I uh, mean classes that I had while we was in school. Those was the four basic, you know, classes that we had to take. I eventually I took a little algebra and stuff when I was in high school and stuff. Other than that, uh, we took Vicar and one of the best ones that we had that the boys had was auto mechanics. So we had an auto mechanic class that we would go to for about four hours. <laughs> During the day and the other three or four hours, we'd go to our other classes, which was English, uh, let me see, social studies, uh, and we had Vicar, which is vocational training, and that's what we took when I was in school. While you were going to school, did you also have a job? Well, I was able to get a job at school. Cause see, I had a child when I was uh, 17, and I got married when I was 17. So I had a job. I'd work probably an hour before school and an hour after school before sports started. But an hour before they helped me all the way through school with the job the school system did. That I was able to get a job for the school through a program that they had, and I can't even recall the program that we had. But it was a summer program for children, certain children, you know, that you could get jobs during the summer and mine carried on during the school year. So I worked that my 11th and 12th grade year in school. And then when I got out of school, I got employed by the Home Hope for two years. And after that, I worked, got hired by public service and stayed there 39 and a half years. What did you do for PSO? Well, I started out digging holes and cutting brush. And then I went to lineman school and was probably in line in the line department for 30-some some years. So I passed advancing. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've done. Mm -hmm. That's how I've done it. So that's what my life has consisted of, plus passing the church for 30-some years, and it's all been here in Bonita. I didn't really have a desire to leave Bonita. My wife, she wanted to move to a few places that we went and visited, but I chose to stay here because I felt like I had pretty well situated, my life was pretty well situated, and I invested a bunch of time in my job and stuff, so I graduated from here, and my three children graduated from here, and now I got a daughter that's uh, working in the school system here, so my boys is not really settled down real good, but my daughter and her family, she's a worker at the school system, so that's what most of my life consisted of, the 63 years that I lived here. Well, tell me about, you know, you, you, you became a pastor of a church. You told me the, the place where you were called to the ministry. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how it all evolved here in Vanita? Well, I think we had mentioned earlier how we went to school. Uh, my mother was almost a requirement that we went to church, Sunday school, and sometimes we'd stay to church. And so I just grew up in the church. And I didn't always go to church, but after I got married, about my son, I think, was about, uh, let's see, about four days old. I'd been in and out of the church after I got up in school and stuff, but after my first child was born, he got real bad sick, and so we, uh, my wife was going to church, but I wasn't, so we prayed for my baby's health, and he got helped, and so I started working in the church, and ever since then, I've been working in the church, and the Lord's just been advancing me ever since then, you know, so I feel like uh, my kind of a compassionate person. <laughs> and I have uh, compassion for people that's less fortunate than I am. And one of the things that would irritate me in life was people who picked and nagged and made fun of other people that was less fortunate, you know, maybe mentally handicapped or something, see them making fun. And I couldn't take that. That would kind of upset me. I might get a little angry, you know, so. 
I think it was a part of my life, and God called me to try to help people, so I have a, a yearning to help people. Life, because life is hard now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's harder now today than it was back in the 50s and 60s. And so I think that's how it all started, that my mother was required to go to church, and what teachings and training I got in the church has helped me in my life, and I want to share what I've been taught with others, you know. Well, tell me about your congregation today. My congregation is a small congregation, mostly. And I've had one person that I've pastored for the 30-some years that I've been a pastor, that she's been with us. And I, now I've got my mother. She's a, My father was a minister also, and he pastored in No Water for probably about 25, 26 years before he passed, and she was a member with him and after he passed she came and joined the congregation that I was passed of and so we have on the road probably about 45 people but every Sunday when we all decide to come we probably have about 25 to 35 people on a regular basis that comes to church uh, regularly and most of it is family oriented most of them are this community really is made up of relatives, but need is, you know. Uh, most of us either grew up here and haven't got very far from here, so all of us is close. It's a close-knit community, you know, with relatives and stuff, you know. So we do have a few people that's migrated in from other states, and what people tell me is because it's, they didn't grow up in the community, that they find it hard to fit in because they feel like it's a close-knit community and people won't let them in, you know, if they strange up, people don't know them. So that's what they share with me when they sit down and talk to me about being accepted in the community and stuff, that that's what they feel like. It's hard to be accepted in this community, you know, if you wasn't from here or just ventured in here. But that's what I try to share with our congregation is accepting people for who they are and wherever they come from so that's what I try to do so that's our church we have a, a active men's group in our church a, a woman's group and our children's group and so not very many because of I, I feel like it's because of the age of the people that's a part of the congregation you know that uh, We've all grew up and got older, and, and I'm trying to get them to get out into the community and affect more people so that we can, uh, listen, uh, most people feel like it's a black or white thing even in the church, but it's not. <laughs> and we got to get them to see that it's more than a black and white thing because I've had people in the community that asked me, that wasn't black, asked me if it was all right if they could come to the church visit the church, so I tell them, sure, we'd be glad to have you, so that's what we're trying to do. So this year we're working on trying to get our members out into the community and get more people to come to the church, you know, that it's for everybody, so that's what we believe about the church, you know. We have a few, like I said, we have some Indians that come to our church, we have some, uh, let me see, Indians, we have a few Caucasians. We have a man that just moved to the community from Claremont. He goes to different churches, but he attends our Wednesday night Bible studies. So hopefully we can get it to grow and get the message out about God. And see, that's the thing. I've even talked to people, said that one of the most segregated times in the United States is on Sunday mornings that we all Maybe in the bigger cities that you can see the congregations mixed, but here in these smaller communities, I still don't believe that we accepted that yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that we have the black churches and the white churches, you know. That's, that's one thing that we haven't accepted yet in these communities. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why it is. It puzzles me. <laughs> well, tell me the name of your, your church and how you came up with the name. Serenity, we 
called it Serenity Missionary Baptist Church. And nine years ago, 11 years ago, 11 and a half years ago, the pastor of First Baptist Church and the pastor of Serenity thought that it was a, we thought that it was a good idea that we, because of the lack of people in the community, that we thought we could have a better serving church if we would combine the congregations together. So we did that for two and a half years and it didn't pan out because people wasn't ready for it. And so we split again and I was able to repurchase the church again for a dollar. They we wrote a contract and they let us get the church back for a dollar. I took a I told them that my wife and myself would no longer attend church at United because they changed it to United from First Baptist. So we started, we had a call meeting to see if any of the members would want to, would like to go with me as pastor because I felt like my past, my calling was a pastor. It wasn't a, I was an administrative pastor at United, but I felt my calling was to be pastor. So. Eleven and uh, nine years ago, we started the Church of Serenity, and we asked the members to come up with the name of the church that we would like to be called. And so, one uh, actually it was one of my granddaughters and a, a, a lady that was attending at the time, and they came up with Serenity, and we looked up, and they gave us a scripture out of Romans eight and one talking about peace and serenity means peace. And so we chose that to be the name of our church and we used the Romans 8 one as the base scripture for the formulation of Serenity Missionary Baptist Church. So that's how it came back and we've been celebrating for nine years as a church. Congregation, like I said, is a growing, I had three associate ministers under me. I have a, one man that we got in training for a deacon, and m most of our congregation is uh, uh, females. Hmm. But the Lord is blessing us on this past Wednesday. We had over nine men that met at the church on a Wednesday night. So we're trying to reach out to men, women, and the children. Mm -hmm. So that's the basis of our church. I told them that's what my ministry was going to be for the men, for women, and for children. So, mm -hmm. well, and, because, and because of this is because of the close knitness of the communities, people in the community feel like they might offend either myself or the pastor of United if they chose to go to the either one of the churches. You know, so. It's a struggle with them deciding which church they want to go to, you know, because we both grew up in this community or in the close vicinity of this community. We started out, all of us, at First Baptist. And that's one of the things, most of them. And the, the thing is that in the South Park, we call it the North End and the South End, and we kind of, you, you kind of right now where the library is in the west section of town. And, the southeast section is mostly where the blacks grew up at, and they had a church, a Baptist church in the south end, which is united, and then Serenity came out of Sunrise Baptist, and that was the north side, and most people on the north side went to Sunrise, and most of them on the south end went to First Baptist, and that's why they have it hmm. that way, you know, so. But I live on the south end of town, and I passed on the north end of town. Challenges. Yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. It is a challenge. It's a great challenge, you know. But I say the greatest challenge is that concerning the church is where we can open it up to all mankind. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. But that's what we're working on right now. Good. Hmm. Um. You know, looking looking back on your life and and your career, what is something that you want people to remember about you? What I really want them to remember about me is I really love God and I love people and I love helping people. 
Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the greatest thing that I can leave as a legacy. I don't want them to remember how good an athlete I was, <laughs> but I want them to know that I love God and love people and love helping people. That's all it's about. That's what my life is centered around. Mm -hmm. That I want it to be said that I love God and I help people when I could help them. And what do you want people to remember about Vanita? About Vanita today, if they one of the things that this this train I get to the question of Jesuit, but one of the things that distracted black people that would move in the community from other place other places where that it wasn't nothing. No entertainment and stuff for people to do in the school system, so they would go to other places and live. I want them to remember, and Benita is kind of, a, I think it's almost like a retirement city. <laughs> that if it's young people that wants to move here, it's not, the job opportunities is not real good here, you know, that people can take care of their families and stuff. But, what I would like uh, people to remember about Benita, Benita as a whole, that we was people that was compassionate and concerning about other people, you know, so that they will know that. And I think it's getting better today that we are, you know. I had to tell them at a council meeting here a while back that the east side of town wasn't just for our people, but it's for all of us at the park and they've been working on the park over there on the east side of town and it's had some nice improvements that the city's made but we got to know that we a city just because I live in one section of town doesn't mean that I'm different from you my make have a diff different color of skin and stuff but we all people with all same aspirations and same desires most of us here wants to make it in life, or we either made it in life or trying to make it in life. So I just want opportunities to grow, that people who want to come to Bonita can come here and live and still feel like they made it in life and they have what they wanted and worked for in life. That this would be a place that you want to stay. And I, I grew up here. I've been to a bunch of places, you know. I've been blessed to go to different places. We, when I've been up to every state in the United States with the exception probably of California and out in the western part of the state. The furthest west I've been is to Denver, Colorado, because i got family there, but I've been all over the United States and I've seen things. And I would like to need to be a place of where people want to come back and visit and enjoy it and see that this is a nice place to visit and enjoy life. That's what I want for Benita, that it is a good place to live and everybody can be treated the same. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add today? I think that's all I can give you. All right. I'll give you my, all that I had and I've enjoyed it and I thank you for it. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yes, ma'am.